is at Katwa, India, a little village 100 miles up the Hooghly River from Calcutta. This evening of June 22nd, 1757, has brought a serious crisis to the British. Colonel Robert Clive, with 3,000 troops, faces the threat of 50,000 well-armed men under the nabob of Bengal. Help that Clive expected has not arrived. Mayor Jafar, high prince of the court of the nabob, commander-in-chief of the nabob's army, had secretly promised to desert his monarch and come over to the British side with 20,000 Indian cavalry. But anxious hours of waiting and watching have produced no results. Whether Mayor Jafar has betrayed the British or is still waiting for a chance to come over, we just don't know. But we June 22nd, 1757, Katwa, India. You are there. Clive of India, on the eve of the Battle of Plassey, back 191 years to the decisive moment when East met West in a great clash of empires. All things are as they were then, except for one thing. You are there. And now? June 22nd, 1757. Katwa, India, and John Daly. Cavalry. It was on this assurance, this assurance from near Jafar, that Colonel Clive left Calcutta and marched 100 miles up the Hooghly River to this rendezvous here at Katwa. For two long hours, Colonel Clive and his staff have been in conference in a stone blockhouse a few yards away. It's the only substantial building in this village of mud huts from which the villagers fled on the approach of the British forces. The conference is over now. We expect Colonel Clive and his staff to come out in just a moment. It has been a tense two hours, not helped at all by swarms of mosquitoes coming up out of the mangrove swamps here along the Hooghly River. And the swamps give up a dank, foul odor. There are also monkeys, and the night birds are in full throat as night falls. They add an eerie touch to an already tense scene. Looking across the Hooghly River, we can see the campfires of the huge army under the nabob of Bengal, thousands of them, bobbing and weaving like firebugs. When the wind is right, we hear weird strains of oriental music. It's all enough to send the shivers up the back of the most unimaginative private. Colonel Clive's small force, exhausted by the long march, is taking advantage of this opportunity for a, a brief rest. The officers are coming out of the fort now. There's Captain Coote. Captain will... No, the captain shakes his head. There's Captain Grant. I can't see Colonel Clive. But there's Major Kilpatrick, who is second in command here. Major! Yes? Major Kilpatrick, will you tell us, please, the decision of the council? Is it retreat or wait for men at Jafar? Withdraw, old chap. Much better word. We're not being forced out of our position, simply withdrawing till a better opportunity to defeat the neighbor comes along. Well, Major Kilpatrick, this does come as a surprise. I thought that Colonel Clive yes, was... Yes, I know. Came as a surprise to all of us. As you say, we expected the Colonel to be full of fireworks. But his attitude was most reasonable. Matter of fact, he advised the course himself. You mean Colonel Clive suggested withdrawal? Well, not only suggested it, but voted for it. But on what grounds, Major? Did, did he give his reasons? Sound military thinking. First off, our ally, Mir Jafar, has proved he can't be trusted. Then our position here could be cut off, you know, or even overrun. The neighbor ever decided to attack us. 50,000 to 3,000, you know. Too much, even for Englishmen. Then the monsoon, starting any day. Matter of fact, they're here now. Roads will be quagmires in a couple of days. No, no, no. Only possible decision, withdraw. Very satisfactory. Very satisfactory indeed. Well, sir, where is Colonel Clive now? In the fort. He uh, asked to be left alone. Poor chap. Wants to do some thinking and weigh his decision. Don't blame him. No commanding officer likes to retreat. Uh, I mean, disengage the enemy. You mean because of his military reputation? Quite so. The courage, you know. Widely known as the daredevil. Always likes to push on. Uh, this must be a bitter pill for him to swallow. But it's the only sensible thing to do. Well, they should put to rest all the stories about his erratic nature. Excuse me, sir. Yes? Major Kilpatrick, the night guard that tale is formed and ready for inspection, sir. Uh, just a moment, Robin. Yes, excuse me, Mr. Daly. I'll have to organize the camp for the night. Of course, sir. Thank you very much, Major. Colonel Clive's force will begin its withdrawal back on Calcutta in the morning. The first time, by the way, that Colonel Clive, or for that matter, any British commander, has refused battle with an Indian force. However, <clears throat> excuse me, 50,000 against 3,000 or kind of odds that even the most enterprising officer thinks twice or many times about before accepting battle. If, however, 
Mayor Jafar had come over with his cavalry, cutting the nabob's advantage, Clive certainly would have fought then. This difficult and probably humiliating decision for Colonel Clive has been caused by that one man, Mayor Jafar. Well, who is he and what is he up to? And here's a man who knows the answers to those questions, Mr. William Watts, who until very recently was official representative of the East India Company at the Nabob's Court at Mashidibad. Uh, Mr. Watts, you know Mayor Jafar personally. Well, what, what sort of a man is he? Oh, why, uh, very capable, very capable. A uh, man of 45, a prince, uh, well-born, well-connected. How is it, sir, that an Indian prince conspires against his own monarch? Oh, he's ambitious, of course. But there's also a move on foot among the other princes to get rid of the Nabob. The Nabob's very unpopular with his own people, you know. In our opinion, he's incompetent, sir. He's uh, unbalanced. He's a young lad of 21, has absolutely no respect for his elders. How do you mean, sir? Well, he seems to take delight in pulling their beers, having them flogged publicly. Well, sir, to uh, get to Mayor Jafar, did you negotiate with him personally, Mr. Watt? Oh, yes. He promised the colonel, uh, secretly, of course, that... If the British marched up here to Katwa, he'd be waiting with 20,000 troops. And as you've said, that would have radically changed the whole military picture. Well, do you think that Mayor Jafar's failure to keep the rendezvous means that he's had a change of heart? Well, it's hard to say. Uh, undoubtedly, the Nabob by now has received wind of the conspiracy. Mayor Jafar may be too closely watched to move. Or he may have come to some agreement with the Nabob. You mean sold uh, Colonel Clive out? Yeah, precisely. But why should he, sir? Colonel Clive had agreed to make Mayor Jafar the Nabob, hadn't he? Yes, but that involves a battle, and a battle involves risk. In my opinion, Mayor Jafar is playing both ends against the Middle East. Well, it's beautiful for assembly. Looks as if we'll begin our draw right away. Yes, it does. And there's Colonel Clive. He's obviously wasting no time in putting into effect the decision to retreat. Rather strange, however, that he should have decided upon a night march. The men won't take very kindly to him. The men are falling in sepoys as well as British soldiers. The sepoys, number 2,000. They're Indian troops trained and officered by the British who make up the other thousand of Colonel Clive's small army. The colonel is striding toward us. The man of medium height, rather stocky build, young, about 30 or 35, I'd say. He's wearing a full-dress uniform, braid down the front, three-cornered hat, with his hair hanging in a pigtail behind, he's on his way to address the troops, I suppose. Colonel Clive! Yes? Colonel, uh, why have you decided to begin this march at night, sir? Can you think of a better time to ford the river? Ford the... But Colonel Clive, I... We're crossing the river to join Mayor Jafar. Well, then you've heard some good news, sir. You've had a message from Mayor Jafar. No, but I've sent a message to him. I I told him my intention of crossing to Plassey and commanded him to break with the nabob and be there before morning. But Colonel Clive, at the Council of War... I've changed just a... my mind since the Council of Retreat to Calcutta is impossible. But why, sir? Prestige, Mr. Daly. British prestige. We could suffer a blow from which we could never recover. Besides, fate hasn't marched me this far up the Hoogly River to turn me around and march me back without what I came for. Victory. Decisive, final, ultimate victory. But, Colonel, suppose when you've crossed, Mayor Jaffa isn't there. He'll be there. He must be there. I have it in my power to make him neighbor of Bengal before tomorrow night. He won't be such a fool or such a villain as to betray me now. But what if you are betrayed, sir? What if you are attacked by the Nabob with his full 50,000 troops? If we are pushed to it, we can withdraw again tomorrow. Tomorrow night. But Mayor Jafar will be there. Kilpatrick. Thank sir? you, Colonel Clive. Are you ready to move, Kilpatrick? To Calcutta, sir? No, we fought the river tonight. What, Colonel Clive? Major, get your troops moving. Yes, sir. Major Kilpatrick has turned and is moving to the head of the line of troops. He looks angry, but in this military world, well, orders are orders, and he's got to do what he's told. He's given the command, which has started this small British force towards the bank of the Hooghly for a dangerous and critical operation. The Nabob may be young and a fool, but he's got 50,000 troops. British scouts have been across the river, but we can't be sure that the Nabob isn't waiting. In fact, hoping that Clive will attempt to cross the river at night. Rarely, if ever, has a battle been fought at night, but this is the Nabob's territory. If he has the initiative to attack, Clive, when half of his tiny forces are across the river, and the other half on this side, he can probably rout him. The crossing operation will be the immediate critical point, the first great hurdle that Clive has to take. We'll move up to the river bank, and as soon as we can test through again, I'll be back on the air, but now to Calcutta. This is Ken Roberts. 
Colonel Clive's dramatic decision to cross the Hoogley River has come as a surprise and somewhat of a shock to Mr. Roger Drake, a senior merchant of the East India Company. Mr. Drake is the present governor of the settlement. That's so. Governor Drake. Yes, sir. What do you think of Colonel Clive's unexpected reversal of his war council? It, 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 it's incredible. Almost impossible to believe. The impact is still so fresh. But it, it's madness. He's walking into a trap. 50,000 Indians against 3,000. Uh, they'll cut him to pieces. But uh, isn't it true, Governor Drake, that the select committee of which you are chairman well, well, agreed to Colonel Clive's leaving Calcutta? Oh, yes, yes, but that, that was a different matter. His mission is to defend Calcutta, the lives and property of all the merchants of the East India Company. Now he's running the risk of losing his troops. It, it, it's folly, unpardonable folly. But, sir, didn't you know there was a risk of battle? Oh, yes, but we wanted him to use those troops only as a threat. A threat to force the Nabob to negotiate a peace treaty. This, uh, this, this conspiracy with Mir Jafar is something that never had our sanction. The colonel entered into that by himself. He would take no advice from us. You mean you were always suspicious of Mir Jafar's good faith? Well, naturally. An Englishman is no match at intrigue with these Easterners. This will, this will con- conspire to overthrow a legitimate monarch, sir. It, 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 it's acts of revolution. Dangerous, dangerous precedent to set. Yes, indeed. Well, the East India Company is here for business, not to meddle with the internal affairs of the country. Well, uh, why do you suppose Colonel Clive has disregarded the opinion oh, of the select oh, committee? Opinion, sir. It wasn't an opinion. It was a mandate. And Colonel Clive ignored it. Then, if I interpret you correctly, Governor Drake, you would advise Colonel Clive to withdraw the British troops immediately and return to Calcutta. I would, sir. As any man in his senses would. As I am sure any professional officer would. Any person who Thank you, Governor Drake. I've just been told that John Daly is calling in from the Hoogley River where Colonel Clive's force is crossing to Plassey. Go ahead, Daly. Go ahead. This is John Daly on the south bank of the ford of the Hoogley River. Approximately one half of Clyde's small force has crossed the river in this airy blackness, broken at intervals along the line of march by rush torches. So far, Clyde's traditional good luck has held. The nabob of Bengal has not shown any sign of resisting this crossing. This is the critical moment. Clyde's forces are about evenly divided. One half on the Plassey bank the other half here on the south bank waiting their turn to cross. So far, and we've got our fingers crossed, the nabob is sticking to the tradition of not fighting at night. A tradition, by the way, probably born of the fact that Indian troops are largely composed of levies of illiterate, unenthusiastic peasants who would rather chill the soil than fight. Major Kilpatrick, second in command, has assigned Sergeant Timothy Wayne to help us move our equipment and to explain the more technical phases of the coming operation. Sergeant Wayne has already been across the river. He went over with the first troops and he's just come back. Sergeant, did you uh, see any of the Nabob's forces over there? Oh, they had some outpost near the river, but they pulled back when we crossed. I didn't see them, but some of our scouts went right up to their camp. And what's the Nabob up to? The scouts say they're whipping themselves into a frenzy with oriental music and drink and lots of mumbo-jumbo. Well, Tim, did the scouts say anything about Mir Jafar? Are there any signs that he may yet come on over to us with those 20,000 cavalry? No, no, he ain't coming. In all that crazy mumbo-jumbo, that jumping and dancing around, this nabo takes his turban off and throws it on the ground. And Mir Jafar, they say, picks it up and put it back on his head. Well, what does that all add up to? The sepoys say that means that uh, Mir Jafar has sworn to defend the Nabob to his last drop of blood. Oh, then it looks like when daylight comes, it's going to be 3,000 against 50,000, huh? I don't care if it's 150,000. I want to go at this Nabob. I promised my brother that I even things with him. Why your brother, Sam? He's in a hospital in Calcutta, sir. He's been there ever since he came out of the black hole. What you mean that now, a full year later, he's still in the hospital? Mr. Daly, sir, do you know what that black hole was like? This dirty nabob put 146 people in the post dungeon where they used to put one of us. Ah, it was kind of awful. He shoved and jammed them in like like they were something worse than cattle. Well, how did your brother come out, uh, Sergeant? My brother stayed quiet and 
suck the perspiration off his shirt, while the others fought like wild animals. Only 23 came out alive. All the rest of the 146 are dead. They died that night in that stinking hole. Well, how did any of them happen to get out, though? Oh, uh, you know what? They wouldn't wake up this dirty little nabob. And then when he does wake up, he says he's sorry. Some underling did it, he says. Ah, he's a bad one, Mr. Daly. He's a bad one. I promised my brother I'd give him Marcus, money. Marcus, Marcus, it looks like the nabob is attacking. Well, hang on a moment, hang on. If he's the tankers, we're in the stew. But Major Kilpatrick told me to stay with you, and I'll be here, Mr. Daly. Don't worry. Right, oh, we'll get ready to knock the equipment down. We'll have to do it one way or another because we'll either head back to Calcutta or get across the river tonight. Righto. The firing has stopped. I can't see across the river. Can't be sure what has happened over there, but... Oh, here comes the... Oh, Captain! Captain! What's that firing across the river? Nothing at all, sir. Some of the men are a bit nervous. The baggage train is going across the stadium. You'll have to come along now if you're coming. Yes, sir. Hello, Calcutta. Hello, Calcutta. We're moving across the river. I'll stay with Colonel Clive. Call you in as soon as we can get the equipment working again on the other bank at Plassey. But now back to Calcutta. This is Ken Roberts in the plaza in front of the East India Company headquarters. News that Clive has crossed the Hoogley River has brought most of the British colony here to the plaza. There is strong partisanship about Clive's move. Many of these people believing that if he is overwhelmed, every British man, woman and child in Calcutta will have to flee for his or her own life. And the East India Company will probably be destroyed. Mr. James Holwell, an East India official, seems to be very pessimistic about the outcome. Mr. Holwell, you evidently think that this time Colonel Clive has bitten off more than he can chew. Well, Mr. Roberts, I'm not exactly a military man, but it does seem axiomatic to me that you don't put all of your eggs in one basket and then put that basket in the middle of a busy thoroughfare. What? But, Mr. Harwell, even, even if the worst should happen to Colonel Clive and, and he's beaten, he will be able to retire until he's reinforced. Mr. Roberts, where do you think these reinforcements are going to come from? We're spread very thin, you know. Well, reinforcements could come out from home, sir. Surely the home government would send our troops. Ha! Home government. You forget, sir, that when the French tried to take over this subcontinent, the East India Company had to fight its battle alone. Clive commands a private army, the East India Company Army. Surely, Mr. Holwell, the King's First Minister, Mr. Pitt, has a deep interest in the affairs of the East India Company. I regret to disillusion you, but it doesn't seem that way, Mr. Roberts. We offer here an opportunity in a great, rich, civilized country, and Mr. Pitt wastes our troops in the North American wilderness. And, Mr. Roberts, I understand that against the French there... Were it not for a young militia colonel named Washington, I believe, Mr. Pitt would have lost even that wilderness. You, would you mean, sir, that you don't think any British troops will be sent out here if things go against you? Well, Mr. Pitt, when everything has been lost, may decide to do something. But then we shall have to start all over again, and 150 years of work will have gone for nothing. Well, I, I hope things are not as bad as all that, sir. We all do. And thank you very much for talking to us. Major, Major Green, uh, Major Humphrey Green has fought with Clive before and is now in Calcutta because he was wounded in the skirmish. Major, what is your estimate of the situation? Well, it's uh, difficult to say, Mr. Roberts. I fought with Clive in the Deccan at Arcot, Cavalry, Pack, and Trichinopoly. Great victories, you know, especially at Arcot, and always get superior numbers. Well, you think, then, that Clive may turn the trick again? <laughs> I don't know, but you can be sure he's thought this out. He has a very uh, uh, peculiar intuition about these Indian people. He's proved it time and again. But as a professional soldier, I must admit that Colonel Clive's strategy is uh, well, very unorthodox. Well, Colonel Clive is a professional soldier, too. Uh, not exactly. He holds an East India Company commission. He depends on the company for pay and rank. He was not trained as a soldier. Uh, you mustn't forget he came out here, let's see, he's uh, 30 now, when he was about 18. Uh, as a writer, a kind of a petty clerk, I think it was, in the dress. He must be a brilliant man, sir. Yes, I would say a genius. You know, in his early days, he suffered from melancholia, couldn't stand being a clerk. As a matter of fact, he's supposed to have attempted his own life twice in those days. Oh, really? Yes, but fortunately, the pistol misfired both times. So after that, he decided fate uh, uh, must have something special in store for him, so he became a soldier. 
And none too soon for the benefit of the... Well, excuse me, Major Green. I just received a message. There's action at Place A. The battle has begun. John Daly crossed the Hoagley with the rear guard of Clive's forces and has his equipment set up, and so we take you now to Plassey and John Daly. Clive's force is fighting magnificently. A second great cavalry charge by the Nabob's forces is breaking up under the pounding of Colonel Clive's ten six-pounder guns. A terrible mass of writhing horses and men is piled up on the field in front of us. And the Nabob's officers are fighting a losing battle against the panic-stricken cavalry, which has begun to break and run back towards the Nabob's camp. The British cannon are still firing. The infantry is jubilant and excited. They look uh, kind of hopefully to their officers for an order to charge. These men have not forgotten the black hole of Calcutta. They don't seem to be at all worried about the fact that the Nabob still has probably ten men for every single one of them. Sergeant Wayne, that was a close one. Ah, uh, don't you worry about it now. If they haven't sense enough to keep their powder dry, we can take care of them. Sergeant Wayne is talking about an amazing piece of stupidity on the part of the Nabob, which has given Colonel Clive an advantage that's almost impossible to value too highly. The battle began early this morning before we could get ready to broadcast with an artillery duel. The Nabob 50 10-pounders against Clive 10 6-pounders, 5 to 1. In the face of the heavy Indian fire, Clive had to order a withdrawal. For a moment, it looked like a retreat, but instead, the infantry was withdrawn to the protection of this mango grove. As they fell back with another unbelievable piece of Clive luck, the heavens opened up, and the monsoon rains came pouring down in torrents. The first thing Colonel Clive did was to protect his gunpowder. The nabob didn't, and his 50 guns fell silent and have been out of action ever since. We've attached ourselves to Colonel Clive, and he's right here. Colonel Clive, those are two heavy Indian cavalry charges, Colonel, which you've just beaten off. Do you think that was your friend, Mayor Jafar? Yes, yes, I suppose it was, but uh, you mustn't be too hard on him, Mr. Daly. Evidently, the Nabob gave him a rather simple choice, either fight with him or be executed. Well, it certainly seems certain, sir, that you've just about taken everything they can throw at you. Not quite. They have another trick up their sleeve. Elephants, Mr. Daly. Elephants. Now you'll uh, have to excuse me. We still have a battle to win, you know. Right, sir. Thanks very much. Uh, Sergeant, what, what's this all about? What does he mean by the elephants? Oh, they are charges, sir, and these elephant charges are pretty awful things. Each elephant carries a prince in a howdah, what the people at home would call a sort of a basket on his back. Then there's the mahout, or elephant driver, who sits up there behind his ears and prods him with a stick, telling him where to go. Look. Look over there at their camp. You can see them now. They're getting them ready. Right, and say, they, they really look like something even in this driving rain. You know, those elephants at this distance don't look as though they can do it. It's an awful lot of damage. They're all dressed up. I don't suppose we can see the colors, but it looks like they've got every color of the rainbow on it from this distance. Yeah, and unless I miss my guess, they're almost ready to come. They're pretty all right. But it won't be so pretty when the Mahouts whip the big beach into a frenzy with their prongs and the cannon drive them crazy with the roar of the smoke and the fire. Oh, if they get up to our lines, they'll be tramping and grudges and to death, they will. Right, here they come, Tim. The elephants have been formed and they're starting their charge. There must be about 50 of them spread out across the plain. The British troops have been ordered out of the protection of the trees and the mango grove and they're forming a battle line, a thin one. Well, what are they doing that for, Sergeant? Why do they come out of the trees? Uh, Why, well, they're forming in ranks, sir, to add their musket power to the cannon. These elephants are hard to stop, and you use everything you've got. Besides, if they get past the cannon, at least we'll get a shot at those blinking princes up there on their back. Well, I just assume we didn't get a chance to shoot at any princes on their back. The elephants have broken into a lumbering trot. The British cannon have stepped up fire. They need to. The elephants are in range. Very few of them are going down. Some are falling, though. I can see one, two, three of them on the ground. But one is twitching and struggling, trying very hard to get up again. But the rest still come on, and they've broken into a gallop. The mahouts on their backs are shrieking and goading them into madness. The cannon are firing just as fast as five cannoneers can load. But they're not enough. They're not enough, and the infantry have begun to fire. There goes the first volley from the muskets. The smoke is getting so, so thick here that we can't see. It gets into your eyes and your throat. It's clearing a bit. And I can see the shapes coming through the smoke. The elephants are still coming. Sergeant Way and those muskets aren't doing any good. Their eyes are too tough, sir. What? What you say? 
Uh, the elephants hide there. They're too tough. The bullets didn't take a bit. The range is too great. The whole earth around here is shaking. Although the elephants are still a hundred yards or so away. Joe Patrick has just shouted an order. Shoot at the riders, the Major says. Shoot at the riders. Major Kilpatrick has ordered the British infantry to fire at the riders and not at the elephants. It sounds like a good idea to me. They're almost on top of us. Colonel Cried is running up and down the line. He's shouting an order. See if you can get it, Sergeant Wayne. I heard him, sir. The car's colonel has countermanded Major Kilpatrick's order. He's telling the men to shoot at the elephants, not at the riders. Shoot at the elephants, he says. Shoot at the elephants. But what in heaven's same fall? Muskets didn't even step their hide. Sergeant Wayne, we'd better get ready to travel. We may have to get out of here and fast. There goes the second volley. The second volley from the musket. The smoke is pouring out of them again. The musket smoke is so heavy it's difficult to see anything. It's so thick now that you can almost cut it. The rain is thicker down over the blanket. All we can hear is the flashing and the trumpeting of these elephants. We don't know what's happening. Everything is confused and uncertain until this smoke begins to pull away from here. I, for one, don't know whether to stand here or to cut and run. Clive's line, his infantry, just as steady as a rock. The men have loaded again, and they stand there in that thin red line. Nobody's giving any sign of breaking at all. They're just waiting for their fire orders. They don't seem to be concerned about what may come thundering out of this heavy crest of smoke. The smoke's beginning to thin out. We can hear the trumpeting of the elephants. You may be able to hear it in the background. It sounds like a bunch of mad monkeys having a fight for all the monkeys in the world in one basket fighting with each other. The smoke is thinning out of this great mass of confusion in front of us now. Oh, right, sir. He was right, Mr. Davy. He learned it in the day camp. Learned what, sir? Colonel Clive learned to shoot at the elephant. Shoot at the elephant. Look at them. Those musket balls are like beastings on the hides of those elephants. He's driving them wild. Yes, the smoke is up. That's right, Tim. The elephants have been stopped. The elephants have been stopped. They're no longer charging forward. They're stopped in their tracks, and their mahouts are hanging on for dear life itself. They can't control them any longer at all. Some of the younger bull elephants are bucking almost like horses, twitting and rearing and churning the air and screaming. Some of those wonderful, magnificent howdahs that we could see across the field a while ago all smashed to smithereens now on the battlefield. They fell off the elephant's backs and were smashed down to the ground. And they're finished! They're finished! They're running away! Yes, Sergeant, Sergeant Wayne is right. Sergeant Wayne is right. The muskets have turned the trick. The elephants are completely out of control. Completely out of control. They're running wildly away from this musket fire. They're shaking their riders from their backs. The leaders are already charging back into their own camp, into the neighbor's camp. Here it is again. Clive's unbelievable mixture of genius and luck. The elephants with which the nabob was going to destroy Clive and his small force are ripping through the Indian camp, destroying and crushing everything in front of him. The Indian peasant levies are throwing down their arms. They're running away for dear life. Colonel Clive! Colonel Clive, sir, you are now the ruler of Bengal. No, Mr. Daly, the British are here to trade, not to rule. If he's still alive, Mayor Jafar will be the new ruler of Bengal. But we'll have peace. Peace trade and friendship with the people of India. Well, congratulations, Colonel Clive. It's a magnificent victory. Major Kilpatrick has come up, and he and Colonel Clive are shaking hands this day of June 23rd, 1757, which dawned so grim and unpromising here at Plassey on the Hooghly River in India is now a day bright with reassurance for the British. June 23rd, 1757. Colonel Robert Clive wins the Battle of Plassey, and British rule begins in India. You have been listening to The Battle of Plassey, another broadcast in the series You Are There. This program was presented originally by CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System, and came to you through the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. Thank you.